good day um, so in today's video lecture i will cover the topic of hypothesis testing which you can see on the board behind me um, this is the uh, the third and the last topic of uh, statistical inferencing that we will cover as part of this course so uh, as i said earlier that this is a interesting take on the same information that you have using confidence uh, for building confidence intervals you can use it for for uh, answering a different type of a question okay so i've already uploaded uh, the slides on moodle these slides uh, i acknowledge my colleagues professor mani bhushan and professor sachin patwardhan who have uh, made these slides and kindly shared them with me lot of pencil okay so this will be chapter 8 of our textbook and this also takes material from Mon montgomery and runga as well as from uh, uh, ogonaiki's uh, random phenomena okay now so far the the other two statistical inferences inferencing methods that we covered in the class was the point estimate where we looked at maximum likelihood principle and we used confidence intervals or interval estimates for a uh, for a population parameter uh, given um, the samples okay so again the setting is is very similar to what we have been doing so far that you have a a population so if i write here a population uh, which has a density f of x and there is some parameter theta that is embedded in it the parameters that we have looked at have been the mean and the variance now from this you have certain samples so the random variable is x and you have certain samples like x1 x2 and x2 xn so this is the same setting that we have used for point estimates as well as confidence interval estimates for the parameter theta now so these were the two methods that you've looked at today we'll look at a third method using similar information and this method is known as hypothesis testing now imagine that uh, there is a court room and in the court room the judge is presented with certain evidences the evidences are not clinching but uh, the evidences are circumstantial and the judge has to make a, a decision about some claim or about some assertion or in this context we will call it a hypothesis for example the hypothesis is that mr x has stolen uh, something okay so that is the hypothesis the judge is given certain evidences and based on those evidences the judge has to say whether mr x has stolen something or mr x has not stolen something okay in hypothesis testing we have a very similar situation there is a claim or an assertion which is made on the parameter for example i might say that my mean is equal to some value the mean of the population for example i might say that my lecture times are always uh, equal to 1 hour the duration of my lecture is equal to 1 hour now if you have data in form of samples like x1 x2 to xn so if you have n data points of actual lecture timings then you can so this this is the circumstantial evidence that you have and from this circumstantial evidence you want to be able to make a statement that whether this is true okay or it is false so this kind of a problem is solved in a hypothesis testing uh, formalism and this was proposed uh, you know by uh, fisher uh, one of the stalwarts of uh, statistics uh, and it has had a very um, very very popular uh, use in solving engineering problems okay 
For example, if I tell you that the temperature of this room is 27 degrees, you make a measurement x1, x2 to xn and then you, you try to see whether the data is consistent with my claim that the temperature is 27 degrees or not. So again, we are talking in terms of a stochastic formalism where uh, 27, so it is, it is not deterministic, the temperature could be fluctuating. And so you want to be able to say whether the mean mu is equal to 27 is uh, that claim is consistent with whatever information I got in terms of the samples. Okay, now this is very, uh, there's a very close connection between hypothesis testing and confidence intervals. You will remember that, have I? Yes, I have. So you will remember that um, in case of confidence intervals, we had six different scenarios and those six scenarios we will also use in the current instance. However, this uh, module just talks about the first two scenarios uh, that you have encountered in the confidence interval, but the methodology is very, very generic and you should be able to extend it to all the six scenarios that were discussed. Okay, so a hypothesis is a statement about the parameters of one or more populations. So you remember that in case of confidence intervals, we talked about one population um, uh, case and we talked about two population cases. So as I just said that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between hypothesis testing and confidence interval. So in that context, you should be able to understand that you could have parameters like mu or you could have two populations. And so you had a parameter like mu1 and mu2 and you wanted to know whether the difference between the two populations is zero or not, okay? Now, um, yes, so the parameter that we are talking about is again uh, theta that you have uh, uh, already encountered whenever we were writing the probability density function. So let me go to the next slide. Okay, let's take an example. So this is an engineering example. Suppose you are interested in the burning rate of a solid propellant which is used to power rockets that launches satellites. So you know that a solid propellant uh, is the one that gives energy and the burning rate will be able to uh, describe what is the thrust generated by that rocket in order to launch the satellite. So if you are buying this solid propellant from another company and they insist or they say that, you know, we have made this or designed the solid propellant so that the burning rate is 50 centimeters per second, okay? Maybe that was a customer specification and the company says that, yes, you know, we have designed it in such a way that it gives you a rate of 50 centimeters per second. So when they say it is 50 centimeters per second, they really would like to claim that this is my population mean, mu, okay? Now, this claim is a assertion or is a hypothesis that mu is equal to 50. You have no way of verifying whether this is correct. You could not take the entire population of the solid propellant, burn them, and then try to determine what was that mean, okay? So in this case, it is a destructive test. It would turn out to be a destructive test. So you would rather take a few samples, n of these, perform the burn rate experiment and generate data. From that data, you would like to know whether this claim of mu is equal to 50 is, is, is consistent with the data or is not consistent with the data, okay? And there, thereby come to a judgment, just like a judge would use this circumstantial evidence to come to a conclusion whether um, Mr. X has committed a crime or has not committed a crime, okay? So let's look at it a little bit more formally. The mu is equal to 50 centimeters per second is known as the null hypothesis H0. This is a very standard terminology. You will always find it being called H0 and it stands for the null hypothesis. So this is the default, okay? 
the alternate hypothesis is H1. So in this case, we are looking at what is known as a two-sided hypothesis test. And in this two-sided hypothesis test, we say mu is not equal to 50 centimeters per second. And this H1 is known as the alternative hypothesis. So before, you, before the judge makes a decision, the judge should know what are the two hypotheses between which he, has, he or she has to choose. So the null hypothesis is that the burn rate is 50 centimeters per second. The mean burn rate, the population mean burn rate is 50 centimeters per second against the alternative hypothesis that the population mean burn rate is not 50 centimeters per second. So this is known as a two-sided uh, hypothesis test. You could have had a one-sided hypothesis where you say that the, the H0, the null hypothesis that mu is equal to 50 versus mu is greater than 50. Okay, so this is a one-sided hypothesis test that mu is greater than 50. So this would be an example where the, the company itself would like to do this hypothesis test and let us say having a greater burn rate is a good thing. Okay, uh, I'm not sure if that is the case, but let me assume for a moment that having a greater burn rate is a good thing. And so I would say that mu is equal to 50 is the null hypothesis and mu is greater than 50 is the alternate hypothesis. And I would use data and try to prove that my burn rate are greater than the customer specified 50. Okay. On the other hand, if the customer could uh, make a check on this hypothesis where they say that, no, we had asked them to give us a burn rate of 50 or greater, but, you know, is mu less than 50? So this would be a hypothesis test that the confidence uh, that the uh, customer would do. So you'll, you'll remember that this is very similar to we had we've had a discussion on how do you choose whether you will have a, a lower confidence interval an upper confidence interval or two sided confidence interval. So this is very similar to that. If you were interested in knowing that it is 50 or not, then you would do a two sided hypothesis test. So that would be a situation where having either greater than 50 or less than 50, both are detrimental to my uh, launching of the project or launching of the rocket. OK, on the other hand, if it I need, you know, I don't mind having more than 50, but it should at least be 50. And then the company would try to do this and show that, you know, the the alternate hypothesis is selected. If I wanted it to be greater than equal to 50, but I want to check whether it is at least 50. OK, um, so here I would then choose. Uh, this particular one-sided hypothesis test. So again, please uh, think about it, how in different situations you would choose different hypotheses. Okay, so a hypothesis is a statement about population uh, and not about the sample. So I hope this is very clear. In, every, in all the statistical inferencing we have done, we are using a sample to tell us something about the population. OK, so it has nothing to do. The sample is only a vehicle or is the evidence in case of hypothesis testing. The question comes as to where does this number 50 come from? OK, why did you choose 50 and why not 51? So it depends on the domain. So uh, it might be a past experience. You might know that it has to be 50 for it to work well. And you want to test whether the material that I'm buying and going to use in the in the rocket or the satellite has satisfies that number or not because if it does not maybe the rocket does not go on its trajectory properly okay um, there could be some other uh, considerations one of the considerations that does happen is contractual obligations okay so in contractual obligations uh, you have uh, a vendor and a customer or a client and they have a contract and their contract for example this happens with uh, selling of gas through a pipeline. So you have these gas producing companies and they supply, for example, you have Gas Authority of India, 
gale and so on and they supply gas through a pipeline to their clients okay so you have uh, 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 like some company like for example you have gale okay gas authority of india limited and they are supplying uh, their gas to a particular customer now there is a certain rate because then they will buy based on the amount of gas that has been supplied but if you have ever seen how a flow rate of gas looks like let's say you're using an orifice meter it's never rock steady okay so it, you cannot say that i have got x meter cube per hour okay now what you have is a very fluctuating kind of a situation so this is what the gas rate is okay so you want to know whether the population mean is equal to that which was agreed upon in the contract so how do you decide so you would like to take a do a hypothesis test use data do a hypothesis test and then come to a conclusion that i am satisfying contractual obligations or i am not so there are many interesting situations where hypothesis testing is used okay now the test hypothesis testing itself refers to the procedure okay it uses the random sample and as we have seen that essentially you have a null hypothesis and so the null hypothesis is the hypothesis that we wish and should be able to test and we have seen that you have an alternative hypothesis now in uh, in practice the null hypothesis which is h not is that hypothesis that you the tester would would like to uh, check for okay so that is the default so you should think of the null hypothesis as the default option and the alternative hypothesis is if i reject the null hypothesis then what is the alternative so for example um, in this case mu is equal to 50 was the null hypothesis it was the default okay and if i reject the null hypothesis then what do i end up with i end up with the alternate hypothesis that mu is not equal to 50 or over here that mu is greater than 50 or in this case mu is less than 50 so the null hypothesis is that you want to test okay um now if the data which is in form of the sample is consistent with the null hypothesis then you would like to accept it you will say i accept the null hypothesis that mu is equal to 50 otherwise you will reject it and therefore by rejecting it you are in some sense saying okay i'm going to accept whatever the alternative hypothesis is okay now we have seen that um there is never this is a stochastic setting and so there is no 100% uh, certainty and so we take the sample n of n consisting of n uh, observations and we would like to check whether the null hypothesis is is the data is consistent with the null hypothesis or not now because of the fact that this is not deterministic we will end up making an error in the judgment okay just like a judge would look at the circumstantial evidence and you know they they say that the preponderance or the weight of the evidence suggest something but there is always a chance that uh, an error would be made yeah an error would be committed in making that judgment so in this case we look at that error in judgment more systematically okay or if we, we we can address that issue uh, more systematically so you have um, a hypothesis test which always requires a test statistic now you will soon realize that these test statistics are something that you have already looked at when you were looking when we were uh, going through module 6 which was uh, when in context of the interval estimates these test statistics so for example a test statistic for the mean mu 
okay is nothing but x bar and you know what x bar is you have the n samples and you take their arithmetic average so it is 1 over n times summation of x i the observations x1 to xn and of course this is over all of i okay that is the test statistic of mu similarly you can imagine what is test statistic for the population variances so the sample average x bar is 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 the test statistic that is used now in hypothesis testing if x bar is close to 50 then you accept h not otherwise you reject it so uh, this is sim similar similar to a judge if the observation suggests that mu is equal to 50 then you accept that mu is equal to 50 otherwise you reject it for example you might decide that okay the x bar has to lie between 48.5 and 51.5 if x bar lies between these intervals or in this interval then i'm going to accept h not otherwise i'll reject h h not and therefore i will in some sense accept h1 okay um so essentially uh, let me uh, i think maybe i can just go to the board okay so uh, for us x bar is a uh, is a random variable which has a particular distribution and so i should be able to uh visualize the 48.5 and 51.5 uh in that using that probability density function so let me draw that on the board and i'll come back okay so i've tried to show that using the probability density function so you will observe that uh, you have mu is equal to 50 this is h not okay so if my x bar this is the density of x bar if it lies between 48.5 and 51.5 as shown on the board i'm going to call this i'm going to accept h not and if it lies beyond this on either side i'm going to reject h not so um this region over here is known as the acceptance region and this region where you reject h not on either side is known as the critical region so that is the terminology that we use so if it is if your x bar that you have which is your test statistic x bar so if the test statistic lies between 48.5 and 51.5 i'm going to accept the uh, the null hypothesis and because it lies in the acceptance region if x bar lies outside the acceptance region then i say that it lies in the critical region and i am going to reject it so that is the way that we uh, do a hypothesis test so what i've drawn on the board is what you have over here um if x bar is between 48.5 and 51.5 then you accept it uh our region outside or less than 48.5 and 51.5 is called the critical region okay uh what is important is that 
the values of 48.5 and 51.5, which are the boundaries between the acceptance and the rejection region, are known as the critical values. Now, so far, we have just arbitrarily taken these numbers 48.5 and 51.5. And the question is whether we can be more systematic about it. Um, now, okay, let me uh, just come back to the board and let's go back uh, to this. Now you will see that on either tails, I will think of the probability on either tails to be uh, alpha by two. So this is similar to the two-sided confidence interval. So the acceptance region has an area of uh, 1 minus alpha and the rejection region has an area of uh, alpha by 2. So uh, and so let's let's continue with the slides. Um, the error that you can make in the judgment are of two types. One is known as a type 1 error. So if this is the truth that H0 was indeed true and you did not reject H0, which means you accepted H0, then you have committed no error. On the other hand, if H0 was true, that is mu was indeed equal to 50, but you said mu is not equal to 50, we call it as a type 1 error. Okay, that's a terminology that is used. On the other hand, if uh, mu was not equal to 50, which means H0 was false and in fact H1 was therefore to be accepted, but you failed to reject H0. So your test using those n samples said no mu is equal to 50 is correct, but in reality it was not correct. Okay, then we say that we have committed a type 2 error. So these are the two, two types of errors that one could commit in uh, while making our decision. Now, uh, so, so again, type 1 error is rejecting the null hypothesis H0 when it is true. And type 2 error is that you fail to reject the null hypothesis when it is false. So there are other terms which are commonly used for type 1 error and type 2 errors. Um, we often call uh, type 1 error as a false positive. Okay. So... Uh, you so so think that uh, there is a problem that you are trying to detect and you said that oh the problem has occurred so you indicated that the problem was positive but in reality that problem did not occur so h0 is true but you um, uh, but you rejected h0 then you said then it leads to a type 1 error on the other hand if a, um, um, if indeed mu was not equal to 50, okay, but you fail to detect that mu is not equal to 50, then you have committed a type 2 error, which we can call as false negative. That means the problem was actually there, but you declared it as negative, that the problem is not there, and that is false. So you have a false positive or a false negative. Very often we also use the term as a false alarm. Okay, so I'll just write it as FA. That's not a standard terminology. Um, or we, if it's a type 2 error, so a false alarm is, is a false alarm as the word indicates. Uh, so you all remember the story of that wolf and uh, the boy uh, who was tending to the sheep would cry wolf and uh, everybody would come. So let us say the boy was not so mischievous. Uh, the boy really thought that there is a wolf. And, uh, but when the people came, they saw that, no, it was not a wolf. It was um, some wind which was blowing and the boy thought that it was a wolf. Then this was turned out to be a false alarm. Okay, so what will happen if the boy keeps on raising false alarm 
the people will never come to help him okay so that is the problem with too many false alarms on the other hand if the boy was asleep and uh, really a wolf came then the boy did not raise the alarm and that was a case of missed detection okay so that is the other terminology mostly used in fault detection and diagnosis so you call it a false alarm or you call it a i'll just write it as md again not a standard uh, acronym i'll call it as a missed detection so the boy forgot or did not raise the alarm and so missed detecting the presence of a wolf that is a type 2 error okay now we want to be able to say what is the probability of committing a type 1 error and a type 2 error so we have to be able to make this distinction so we will call alpha as the probability of committing a type 1 error so type 1 error means you are rejecting the null hypothesis h0 when h0 was indeed true okay and this is also known as the significance level or the alpha error of the or size of the test so in our case um let me go to the board because i have already drawn oh i missed producing this okay that's why i should not go to the board very often but let me quickly go back and go through i think it was uh, this slide okay and then i would have come to this slide so again we were looking at errors and uh, the decision uh, procedure can lead to either of two wrong conclusions and one is a type 1 error so i'll just quickly repeat again type 1 error is that the null hypothesis was true but your samples ended up using and your hypothesis test ended up rejecting the null hypothesis this is type 1 error okay type 2 error is when the null hypothesis is indeed false but you were not able to detect it your testing procedure did not say that uh it is false and i use the term false positive and false negative you can go back to that uh, discussion and i also use the term false alarm and missed detection and i was saying that these terminologies are very commonly used in fault uh, detection and diagnosis literature so uh, for example if there is a reactor and there is a temperature and you want to make sure that the temperature of the reactor is kept in some limit so you have the mean value okay and you have an upper control limit as we call it and you have a lower control limit okay so you can perform a hypothesis test to find out whether the mean value because the temperature is going all over the place okay and you want to raise an alarm if the temperature is not at its target value so this will alert the operator and the operator will go and take corrective action this is what a control system does so if i have set the alarm in such a way that it always goes off that means that mean and when the operator goes and checks he he or she finds that um, the temperature is all right then uh, you have it has committed a type 1 error that is the alarm is false on the other hand if the temperature was really going away from the target value but the alarm was not being raised then this is a case of missed detection let me check this once again yes uh, so let me go to this slide so we were trying to say that these uh, uh judgments uh, errors in the judgment we can ascribe a probability to it and the probability that we will ascribe to a type 1 error is called alpha okay so we are essentially trying to say that uh, and this is where i was trying to go to the board when i so let me just go and remember to come back to the desktop so um, as you can see that 1 minus alpha over here is the uh, is the uh, is the probability so so this probability distribution function has been drawn using mu is equal to 
okay so we have assumed while drawing this probability density function that mu is equal to 50 is indeed true okay if we make that assumption i can draw this probability density function and now i have these two bounds where i have put the uh, the area as alpha by 2 and alpha by 2 and that is the if the distribution really belonged to h naught which means mu was 50 but if there was an outlying observation like which lay in either of the tails then i would end up rejecting h naught when h one naught was true so i would be committing a type 1 error and what is the probability of committing that type 1 error the probability would be alpha by 2 plus alpha by 2 which is alpha so you should realize that alpha is the probability of committing type 1 error so let me go back to my desktop so in this case um, a type 1 error would occur when your x bar value lay in the critical region not in the acceptance region but the true mean was indeed 50 now you will you can ask me how do you know uh, that the true mean is indeed 50 and uh, so in this case it is under the assumption of h naught okay so that's an assumption and if you knew that if you knew the true value of or the value the true value of the population mean then um, you would not be doing this test okay so there is that chicken and egg issue that we deal with now supposing that the standard deviation uh, is 2.5 centimeters per second so you know that x bar belongs to a normal distribution with mean being mu and the standard deviation being sigma by root n and we have seen many a times that even if the individual xi were not normal that x bar is tends to be normal like uh, because of the central limit theorem so when h naught is true so under the assumption of h naught my distribution of x bar would be a normal distribution with mean 50 and the standard deviation being 0.79 so you should realize that 0.79 is sigma by root n sigma is 2.5 and n i believe is 10 okay so this is based on 10 samples so now you can try to find out what is the value of alpha so Assuming that H0 is true for the case when mu is equal to 50, you can ask yourself what is X bar, what is the prob what is the probability that X bar is less than 48.5 and X bar is greater than 51.5. And you know how to find this probability. Uh, you have to standardize this variable. So you subtract mu, which is 50 in this case, under the assumption of H0. So you subtract out 50 and then you divide this by sigma by root n so if you do that this will belong to the unit standard normal distribution and so you can use your z tables or you can go to r and find out those values so this turns out 48.5 turns out to be minus 1.9 and because this was symmetric we had chosen it to be symmetric 51.5 will turn out to be plus 1.9 so alpha therefore is the probability on the two extreme tails and this probability turns out to be 0.058 so this probability explicitly tells me that the 5.8 percent of all samples will lead to rejection of the hypothesis mu is equal to 50 when mu is indeed equal to 50 which means that this is the error in judgment that i will make okay of type 1 error that even though the true population mean was 50 5.8 percent of the times i will reject it and therefore commit a type 1 error now uh, you know the, the slide uh, insists that you should try to uh, sketch this probability density function and indicate the type 1 error so i request you to to take a pen and a uh, paper and just sketch try to sketch these okay so a question often is that how do we reduce the type 1 error and you will say that seems uh, straightforward enough so 
if I wanted to reduce the type 1 error, let me go to the board. Okay, so alpha by 2 for me was uh, 5.8, so it is going to be 0 0.029 on both sides. Okay, now if the question is, you are not happy with this 5.8%, you want to be able to reduce the error. So then instead of 48.5 and 51.5, you can choose two new critical points or you can choose new critical points as as 48 and 52, okay? As 48 and 52. So if you use 48 and 52, then you can see that the area of the curve on either side beyond 48 and 52 uh, will become uh, uh, even lower. And you can do a quick calculation and see that that alpha is just 1.14%. Okay, so this is one way of increasing your acceptance region so that you do not reject H0 uh, when H0 is true. Now, the other way is by, check whether I have done this, yeah. So the other way is by increasing the sample size. So for our example, if, if you know, we had N is equal to 10, if you increase the number of samples from 10 to 16 and you take the same standard deviation, then the 48.5 uh, to 51.5 will correspond to a type 1 error of 1.6% and not 5.8% uh, as before. Okay, So um, you could have the same 1.6% uh, uh, type 1 error using the same margin of 48.5 and 51.5 provided you had larger number of samples, okay? And you should be able to uh, um, visualize why that is the case. Uh, you will see that as the n goes up, you know that the standard deviation sigma by root n comes down. And if that happens, then this curve becomes flatter. Or I'm sh sorry, it becomes narrower. So, Okay, and now you can see because it has become narrower under on the left of 48.5 or on the right of 51.5, the area under the new curve, I don't know if I have another color. I don't think I have another color. The, the area under the new curve, the narrower curve is much lower and that was the 1.6%. Okay, so as N goes up, as the number of samples go up, you can make a better judgment. All right. Now, it is important uh, that we also talk about the type 2 error probability. Now, we will call the probability of committing type 2 error as beta. Okay. And remember that type 2 error was the case of missed detection. That is, H0 was false, but you failed to reject it. Okay, so that is the case of missed detection. Now, um, we would like to compute beta, but uh, unlike alpha, for if you, if you now remember that H0 had a specific value of mu given to you, but H1 did not have a specific value, and that deters us from trying to calculate the value of beta. So, if uh, you have uh, um, the the specific value that so so if you say that h naught is mu is equal to 50 which is over here okay uh, and h1 
if you were to give me a specific value which is not given when we do this test but let us say instead of saying mu is not equal to 50 you say that mu is equal to 52 okay a specific value so this is a scenario that of course h0 got rejected or, or h0 is mu is equal to 50 but let us take a scenario under h1 where mu is equal to 52 okay then the acceptance region for H0, as we discussed, was 48.5 to 51.5. So then the probability of committing a type 2 error would be that the true distribution has a mean of 52. So under H1, the mean is 52. That is the scenario that we have adopted under H1. But the sample fell in the acceptance region of H0. That is, it fell under between 48.5 and 51.5. So that would be the situation where actually the, the H0 was not true. Mu was not 50. In fact, it was 52. Okay, But the sample value fell in the region, in the acceptance region of H0. So that value is known as beta or the type 2 error probability. Now, uh, we go back to the board and just draw that other distribution. So what we are saying is that the true distribution was 52. Okay. So I will let me. So we are saying that the true distribution is actually mu is equal to 52. So, but what is the error that will be committed in using uh, this um, mu is equal to 50 will be uh, basically the area and I'm going to shade it over here. So the shaded area is telling you what is the probability under H1 is equal to 52, but that which lies in the acceptance region of H0. Okay, so that is the value of beta. So in our example, if we had taken 48.5 and 51.5, uh, then we had to calculate the area under the curve when mu was 52 and so I'm going to normalize this or you know go to the standardized variable by subtracting 52 from both sides and dividing by sigma by root n. So those values are shown over here and it turns out that with respect to 52 distribution the standard variables the unit standard normal variables take up a value of minus 4.43 and minus 0.63 okay. Um, I hope that is clear and if you do that uh, you can find out that the value of beta turns out to be 0.264 so roughly if the true value was of mu was 52 but you were your null hypothesis had mu is equal to 50 then roughly 26.4 percent of the times you would end up missing detection of the fact that uh, the mean is not equal to 50. Okay, you would miss saying that out. Okay, so the question is, what does beta depend on? Okay, and you have already from the figure that I drew on the board, you will realize uh, certain things. It uh, depends on uh, how close um, the 52 and 50 are. If let us say instead of mu is equal to 52, so the hypothesis test I'm doing is still for mu is equal to 50, but let us say instead of mu is equal to 52, I was checking with mu is equal to 55, then beta value would change. If I had made it 
mu is equal to the under h1 i would say mu is equal to 49.5 the beta value would change okay because the the second curve would keep on shifting with respect to the first curve which is under h0 and uh, beta also depends so 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 one very important point is this trade off between alpha and beta in general as you try to increase the or decrease the type 1 error then beta increases okay and again you should be able to look at that graph and be able to say let me see if i can just um, um draw it right over here so this is under h not okay let's say these were my critical points now i have a beta and let me draw the like this so remember that the beta value is this okay and all the way into the other end of the acceptance region now if i were to change this critical region if i were to in, if i were trying to oops, sorry if i were trying to reduce the value of alpha and how will i reduce the value of alpha not by increasing number of samples but by saying that my new value of alpha is this okay so if my new value of alpha is this then you know that the same curve this is under h1 which i am trying to use the pencil and indicate then now you can see that there is more amount of area under once you have moved the critical point towards the extremes of the tails so in that case the new value of beta has this additional amount okay and this goes all the way to the other side so the value of as you try to reduce the value of alpha what has happened to beta beta has actually gone up okay now beta also depends on uh, on the sample size n and as n increases beta decreases and again you should be able to draw a narrower density and be able to rationalize that this is indeed the case this is a summary uh, for the propellant example and i would uh, encourage you to try to calculate these numbers on your own we have already looked at this particular example when it when mu was 52 so this is scenario 1 under h1 okay i will write it as s1 and this is scenario 2 so to be able to calculate beta you really need scenarios otherwise you don't know for what mu value you should try to calculate whereas in case of calculation of alpha you just need the hypothesis the null hypothesis value mu is equal to 50 so so in that case it is always easy to calculate but here you need different scenarios so you can see like we discussed i just discussed that if you had brought mu closer to 50 you made it 50.5 for example then the value of beta has Uh, has uh, increased again just draw it and you will see that that is the case okay so these are for sample 10 and these are for samples number of samples being equal to 16 please do these calculations uh, using the normal distribution table the unit uh, the standardized unit normal distribution table given to you at the back of your book so again alpha beta are related decreasing one increases the other for a fixed n uh reducing the size of the critical region uh it decreases alpha but it increases beta if your n is fixed generally if you increase n that is the only way that both alpha and beta can reduce or can become lesser so when h not is false then beta increases as the true value of the parameter approaches the the value hypothesized in the null test so when if let us say this was your h not and so this was mu is equal to mu not this is mu not and if i have under h1 okay then this is the scenario 1 which i will write for now is mu s1 okay scenario 1 now as you come choose different scenarios where you keep approaching closer and closer to mu not 
you will see that the value of beta increases. So you can do a simple thought experiment to convince yourself of that. Okay. Some more conclusions are that uh, how do you choose alpha? And you typically choose alpha to be very small. And why is that? I told you in the beginning that uh, the, the the case of the case of uh, the null hypothesis is the default. Okay, an alternative hypothesis is um, is what you would try to show using the data. Okay, so you really want to be very sure when you want to be able to discredit the null hypothesis and therefore establish the alternative hypothesis. And so it is very important that alpha be small, the probability of committing type one error should be small. Imagine this, uh, you have a cooling system and uh, you, are sh you feel that it is not working correctly. So your null hypothesis is that it is working correctly. Okay. And your alternate hypothesis is that it is not working correctly. So you want to make sure that the error in committing, uh, uh, the error in trying to reject or, or saying, using samples that it is not working correctly, when in fact it was working correctly, should be very small. And why is that? Because if you make that judgment that it is not working correctly, while it was indeed working correctly, you would end up spending huge amount of money buying a new cooling system and doing away with the old one. So that is why alpha values should be small. So you should choose a, typically a small value of alpha. We choose the, it to be 1% or 5%, um, sometimes even maybe 10%. Now, since probability of wrongly rejecting H0 can be controlled, which means by choosing alpha, rejection of H0 is a strong conclusion. Okay. What this says is that as a tester, you should try to, you should use H1 as that which you are trying to establish, okay, and H0 as the default because failing to reject H0 is not a strong conclusion, but rejecting H0 is a strong conclusion because the error in making, um, uh, uh, in rejecting H0 when H0 was true, that is alpha is, I, we choose it to be very small, okay? So rejecting H0 is a strong conclusion. And this also tells you, so for example, uh, we use this example of uh, nicotine content in, a, in, in cigarettes. And so if you are a regulator, okay, then you would say that the nicotine content is equal to that which is prescribed, okay? So you bought some, some of that product from the market and you've done a test. So you will say that, so your H0 will be that mu is equal to uh, that which is uh, specified, the target. And your alternate hypothesis in this case will be that no, it is greater than the target, okay? So you would do a one-sided test because H1 should have that which you are trying to prove. And why is that? It is because proving H1 or um, is is a proving, oh, this is H, this is H1 and this is H0, okay? So proving H1 is a strong conclusion. Failing to reject H0 is not a strong conclusion. It is the default, okay? So always you should, that which you are trying to prove should be in H1, okay? Now the type two error beta is not a constant, but as I told you, it depends on the scenario that you're looking at, okay? And um, so it depends on that scenario, it depends on the sample size and cannot be controlled independent of alpha. So we've always seen that if you try to reduce alpha, beta increases. And because of the fact that you can only assume some scenarios, beta is often unknown, but you can do a scenario analysis. Okay, so we've already discussed that rejecting H0 is a strong conclusion. Failing to reject H0 is a weak conclusion. Okay, um, and therefore you should always try to, that which you're trying to prove 
should be in H1. Okay, quickly let's look at the power of the test. Now, a power of a statistical test is the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis H0 when the alternative hypothesis H1 is true. So, this therefore is equal to 1 minus beta because it is the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis H0 when alternative hypothesis H1 is true. So, it, is, it, it tells you the power of that test and different statistical tests are often compared based on their power for a given alpha. Okay. All right. Uh, so, the overall procedure we have to summarize is you identify the parameter of interest, you state the null hypothesis, state the alternative hypothesis, choose alpha, determine the test statistic. Now, the moment you determine and you know that what it, it uh, varies as, you can tell what and you have already chosen alpha. So, with these two pieces of information, you will be able to give me the critical points. As soon as the critical points are given, I know my critical region C has got uh, established. Now, that is the critical region. Then I compute the test statistic and I see if the test statistic lies in C, I reject H0. If it lies in the acceptance region, I, I do not reject H0. Okay. So, this is now uh, scenario 1. In this uh, scenario, when I talk about scenario, I am really referring to the six scenarios or situations that we had seen or cases that we had seen when we were looking at interval estimates. Uh, in this scenario, you have the situation where the variance of the population is known. And uh, in this case, you have a random sample. You want to be able to test this claim that mu is equal to mu naught, the alternative being that it is not. So in this case, you construct, so alpha is given to you. So you can construct the, the critical region. X bar lies as such. Okay. And so if H naught is true, so this tells you the acceptance region. So this from minus Z by alpha by 2 to Z of alpha by 2 is your acceptance region. And that probability is 1 minus alpha. I hope this is true. So I'll just flash the board. So you can see that the acceptance region is 1 minus alpha and the critical region is alpha by 2 on either ends. And so uh, you can write this statement. So you would uh, reject H0 if your test statistic, which is Z0, lies in the critical region. And you should not reject H0 if it lies in the acceptance region. Okay, let's look at an example. The mean burning rate of a propellant must be 50 centimeters per second. Given that the standard deviation is 2 centimeters per second, uh, experimenter decides to specify a type 1 error probability or significance level of 0.015. So 5% you're willing to make an error in your judgment, you know, type one error. You have 25 samples and you obtain an average of 51.3. So you want to say that I have got a sample average of 51.3, but is the population mean indeed 50? So your null hypothesis is this, alternative is a two-sided test, alternative hypothesis is mu is not 50. Alpha is given to you. So you need those two critical points, Z of 0 0.025 and minus of Z of 0 0.025. And that turns out to be, that is 1.96. So in this particular case, the test statistic came out to be 3.25. So you know that for the standard normal distribution, uh, this value, the test statistic lies in the critical region because it is greater than 1.96. And so you say that H0 is rejected at a significance level of 0 0.05. That is 
that is there is a strong evidence that the mean burning rate is not 50 okay all right uh, let me do one more topic before i stop uh, and that is this p value so there is a problem in this hypothesis test and the problem is that if i had uh, asked you to solve this problem again but i had told you okay can you check what happens at the z of uh, 0. Uh, or, or sorry with, with alpha is equal to let us say uh, 0. Uh, uh, 1% or 0. 0.1 which is 10% okay you'll have to do this entire problem again remember that the data has not changed only the prescription of the level of significance has changed so to overcome this situation see whether i am yes so to overcome this situation we can use a p value okay so one way to report the results of a hypothesis test and this is what r will do for you is that it will report for you uh, a p value and the p value we will look at this a little bit further a p value is the smallest level of significance that would lead to rejection of the null hypothesis test. So if you had chosen a value of, uh, of alpha, which is equal to the p value, then this was the smallest value of alpha that would lead to rejection of the uh, null hypothesis with the given data. So note, because the data does not change, I should not be just having to redo the test just because alpha changes. So let's just visualize this. So if I find out the p-value, then the p-value is, in this case, uh, using that data, uh, I will call this area as p by 2 and this side as p by 2. So the total probability is p. So the p-value gives you that value of alpha and the smallest such a value of alpha under which you your data would suggest that the null hypothesis has to be rejected so now if you choose an alpha value smaller than the p value which means you're on the right side over here and the left side over here then uh, if you were to do that test uh, your null hypothesis would get rejected and if you were larger than that value, then you would end up accepting the null hypothesis. And that is where, you know, this statement, which is there, that if you torture data enough, it will confess to almost anything. You know, statisticians are often, um, you know, said that they can move things around to suit their convenience or to suit the convenience of, of the of the funding agencies or whoever is supporting them. Um, so if you choose your alpha values in such a way, you could you know, make it accept or reject. So that becomes a, some subjectivity as to how did you choose that alpha value. So you can do away with that by saying that I'm going to choose a P value. Okay, so for the propellant example, uh, we got the test statistic as 3.25. And at 5% significance level, we had rejected it. So you could calculate the p-value as for that test statistic. So if your test statistic uh, fell here, okay, this was 3.25 here on the unit normal. So I will go symmetrically on the other side. This over here is 0. Okay, we're talking about the unit normal, then I can ask myself, what is this area on either side? And this area is nothing but the p-value. So it tells me that for that realization of the statistic, if I had chosen that p-value and that is calculated here is 0 0.0012. Okay, so it tells me that for any value above 0.0012 is the value of alpha, you would end up rejecting the null hypothesis that mu is equal to 50. So 
it gives you it gives it's like a solution key of an of a of a problem so it already tells you what is that smallest value of alpha at which the null hypothesis would be rejected so very often people don't do a hypothesis test they take the data they do a find the p value if the p value is very small like 0.0012 then you know that for any reasonable values of alpha the the null hypothesis the data uh, is not consistent with the claim of the null hypothesis okay so it, it just tells you that whatever is being claimed so the null hypothesis the data does not seem to support it it is not supportive of the null hypothesis okay so um, just this connection between uh, hypothesis testing and confidence intervals so i would like you to just write down how did we derive a confidence interval we started with the same test statistic only we put mu in the middle and we found out the two bounds or the confidence bounds or uh, the upper level and the lower level uh, so so you see the same statistic is being used here so there is a strong connection between the two so if you have a confidence interval with a lower and an upper values for 100 to 1 minus alpha percent uh, confidence interval for theta and you choose a value of do a hypothesis test with theta is equal to theta not and theta is not equal to theta not so if this theta not lies in this interval okay then at that same significance level of alpha you will not reject h not okay and if this theta not does not lie in this interval then at the in that 100 to 1 minus alpha percent confidence interval then you will reject h not okay so there is a very strong so there is in some sense it is equivalent to be able to do a confidence interval um building and a hypothesis test even though equivalent procedures each provides different insights um and the nice thing about is this is that you get a p value uh, which uh, helps you make uh, decisions okay statistical decisions okay so we have talked quite a bit about type 1 error what about type 2 error and uh, as i told you type 2 error is a little bit more tricky because you need to know a scenario okay if mu is not equal to mu not then what is the value of mu okay and so you can think of beta as depending on that scenario what in which case uh, you would like when h not is not true okay what is that value of mu and so you can parametrically find out what is the uh, what is the value of beta so this is in any um, in many situations in reliability and so on we often build what are known as operating characteristic curves and that basically is a curve between beta and mu minus mu not or some some function of mu minus mu not now um, you can so so again it depends if mu is not equal to mu not then what is it and that is a parameter over here so this beta of mu is the acceptance of h not when h not is false and h1 has mu value as some parameter mu so you can again standardize this and calculate that probability under so this probability is being calculated using Uh, the mean not being equal to mu not but the mean mu being equal to my some scenario okay so mu is equal to some scenario uh, which is called as mu in this particular case so when you want to find out the probabilities you will have to find the probabilities under this curve and not under the curve mu is equal to mu not so you will have to renormalize this using mu because the, you are trying to standardize it using that particular value and you should be able to calculate what is that value uh, beta okay this is the type 2 error probable probability okay now and most of the times when you do it 
So this on the x-axis, we have some measure of how far is that scenario mu from the null hypothesis mu naught. And this tells you the probability of accepting H naught. So this is known as the operating uh, characteristic curve. So you can see that when the two curves are very far from each other, assuming n and sigma are constant, then you are over here. So this is the case where um, mu is equal to mu naught is here and mu is equal to far away from mu naught. Okay. So you can see that the, uh, the beta is almost zero. So the value of beta over here is almost zero. Whereas if these two curves overlie on each other, okay, then the value of beta is very large. So in this way, you can uh, draw an operating characteristic curve and it gives you an idea about uh, the various scenarios. Uh, and let us say you are trying to do a robust design where you're designing under uncertainty, then you can make use of uh, these different scenarios and make sure that, uh, you know, like for example, people do seismic design of buildings. So they take some assumption, okay, you know, you will suffer, you will uh, get hit with an earthquake of so much magnitude and you want to be able to design it for that. So in the same way, you are trying to design for uncertainty and you can make use of the operating characteristic curve uh, uh, in, and take it as an input in your design. Okay, uh, so, uh, okay, let me do this particular example. Let's see what is the next and I can probably uh, stop after that example. So if a signal of value mu is sent from location A and then the value received at location B is normally distributed with mean mu and standard deviation 2. That is, the so, so we have seen this problem before. You have two stations. You have station A from where you are transmitting mu, okay? And what you are receiving at B is not mu, okay? It has got smeared with noise and you end up, you know, the noise has this distribution. 4 is the variance. And this signal is sent five times. And the average value received at x bar is 9.5. Then determine the probability of accepting the null hypothesis that mu is equal to 8. So 8 here is mu naught. So this is h naught. Okay. Uh, when the actual value sent was not 8. Okay. But the actual value sent was 10. So this is a scenario where you don't know what is the true value of mu. You were testing for mu is equal to 8. But what if the actual value sent was 10? Okay, so that is will allow you to draw the other curve. So in this case, uh, you can uh, find out. So you're trying to calculate beta. So it's just an application of this particular formula. So you have these two quantities. And uh, there must be an alpha value that should be... Uh, given to us. So in this case, uh, well, this is, uh, this is uh, beta. So I have, uh, yeah, the alpha value is given to you over here. So it is 0 0.05 or 5% 5, uh, 5 is the value of alpha. So for that value, your value of beta turns out to be 39.2%. Okay. So it's just an application of that. All right, so let me stop here. I have discussed with you uh, p-values. I have discussed with you, uh, um, so, so to summarize, I have discussed how to do a hypothesis test. We've looked at two-sided hypothesis test and a one-sided hypothesis test. Um, remember that you first have to specify what the null hypothesis is, the alternate hypothesis, the significance level of the test, and then the test statistic under question. So you can imagine that if you did not know sigma, so let us say in this particular problem, they told you that the sample standard deviation is two and not the true standard deviation or the population standard deviation. Then you know that the underlying statistic will not be the Z variable, but it will be the T variable with N minus one degrees of freedom. So you can apply the same procedure, but using the T uh, distribution.
okay so i will stop here uh, and i think i'm going to meet you on june 1st so i will do hypothesis test at that point uh, again uh, stay safe and uh, i will see you in the first week of june thank you